was looking at. And that many of us thought that the book was so difficult to come back. So someone who had the book, you would have thought they had a pot of gold. It's just a book, that's all it is. Maybe it took, it cost 20 or $30 because it's a notebook, one of those office notebooks with the page and the diagrams in it. So page 62 is what they say, cultivating change. And also they've got um, citywide input. 15,000 Mythians participated. Well, Talu, did you know about all this? No. Cedric, we found out about it a little later on, didn't we? Yeah, we found out about it later on. But we didn't know anything about these 15,000 people. Didn't know nothing about it. Yeah. So, and then let's look over here. And this is on page 33. Three we don't take 10, 15 minutes here. All right, well, also, uh, about that um, that date and time for yes. the, uh, the big meeting? Yes. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, April 17th. Yes. At two, uh, oh, 2019. That's uh, 6 p.m. Yes. To 7.30 p.m. Yes. At the Dave Wells Community, Community Center. And just in case you don't know, it's at 915 Chelsea. Right. All right. And here on page 62, it's a little awkward here. Uh, this is a new thing that we're working on here, but uh, I think it's going to work out. Pretty doggone good. Cultivating change. On page 62 is what they are talking about, 3.0. Oh, and Omar Baruti is here. And I'm going to take another chance, Omar. I was wondering what the three was. I put out there, maybe it's three billion, three billion dollars. But here I go again. Hey, Cedric, yes, sir. taking my chances. Yes, sir. I think I figured it out. Third century. I don't understand the decimal point to zero. Third century comp Memphis Comprehensive. Plan. Give me a call and, and uh, tell me, hey, Wallace Ridge, you're misinforming the people. But real quick, Memphis 3.0 Vision sets a new course for the city of Memphis so that all neighborhoods have the opportunity to benefit from growth and change in the city. In this vision, change is for the better by planning and coordinating how and where change happens. This plan seeks to catalyze private development and public investment to maximize the benefit to all Memphians. Every place in Memphis has room for improvement and thousands of Memphians from across the city offered ideas for how Different kinds of change could contribute to a better Memphis. This plan captures those ideas and provides a framework for distributing positive change across the city, especially to places that have not benefit, benefited from change in the past. Well, you got that right. And so we question this comprehensive 3.0 plan. Because in the past, we've not seen this in certain neighborhoods. Hey, you take this neighborhood right here, Nutbush City. Right down Hollywood, down Hubbard Street, North and South Memphis. And the way this plan is written, is vague over general. And so we say, get involved. Don't just sit there and complain. Come to the meeting. Sit at the table. And forget what people say about you. 
You know, somebody said, you know, that was Red and Talu. Uh, those guys are professional instigators. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> That's what I heard too. <laughs> well, Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. I heard that they also threw in uh, 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 our minister Omar Brood in that. They, they threw that name in there. They didn't, they didn't throw his name back. Yeah. They, they said, those guys. So I'm sitting, and I really don't care. I've got work to do. And you have to figure out why you're on the plane. And the way you do that is look back, and I'll get back to the point, man. You look at what you remember from when you were born. The things that you did, you used to do, the mistakes you made, you made, and you say, uh, I'm born to do this, or whatever. And so I do recall going to meetings and raising questions. Uh, I recall going to a lot of meetings, and if it was, but I remember the back in the day, the, the uh, what was it, Omar, the instigate, uh, organize, and educate. Instigate, educate, and organize. I remember that. So maybe that's what they're talking about. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but anyway, so let's let's hear from Cedric. You know something about this 3.0. You've been to a few meetings. You've met, and they have the O, the the O P O, the O C P, the Office. No, O P D, the Office of Planning and Development. And yes, yes we want to, we want to. Uh, is my mic working? I think your mic is working fine. Okay. We want to meet with the people. The people of 3.0. And we are saying that, we are saying, cut us in or cut it out. And we're saying we want to make sure. That this is not a trick. And so we are willing to negotiate, compromise, or fight for the people. I go to you next, Cedric, and we'll take Omar, Kalu, and in that in that uh, in that vein. Go ahead, Cedric. Yeah, well, you know, the uh, three point oh. Uh the uh, the uh, the attention that uh, Dr. Atwater has gotten is a great one. And it's uh, good that uh, the people are informed today and start getting involved because this is the, it sets the structure for the next 20 years of yes. the direction they're going to take uh, with Memphis, Tennessee. And um, we see all of the commerce and economic uh, plans that they have for Memphis, Tennessee. But what we don't see is a lot of, um, involvement of the people and when you when you talk about it when you talk about a city in order to have a city you have to have a population so the population is the city and which is the people at the end of the day so uh how could you possibly be putting together a plan and it didn't involve the people when it's a plan for the people so um you know as you said this wasn't a plan to throw uh, 3.0 in the, in the ocean. It was a plan to pump your brakes, right. uh, slow it down just a little bit, right. uh, and, and uh, you know, take along your, your, your partners with you. You know, uh, you, you know, you're not out there by yourself, Mr. Mayor and, and Planning Commission. You know, there's a city that uh, is concerned, and there's a city that uh, that would like to know where they fit in. Uh, you know, uh, I, I see a few years ago you guys just had people come in and take over your land and throw uh, highways and byways in, throw bridges on top of people's uh, communities. And, uh, you know, it just changes the fabric of the community. Uh -huh. When you used to have neighbors across the street from you, and now you have a big wall across the street from you. You know, it's a, it's a big difference in the, in the fabric of the community. When you put a big factory in that might be doing some type of uh, ridiculous uh, waste projects or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and it's right in your residential community, these are the plannings uh, for that right now. And 3.0 is supposed to be taking precedence over zoning so that those things could happen. And, um, you know, even the, uh, the zoning commission won't have as much uh, power and say so as 3.0. So I think it is definitely important that the people are aware mm -hmm. so that, uh, th you know, we're all involved. Yes. It would call on the people to 
rise up and stand up and speak up and speak out. Come to the meeting and have a seat at the table. Speaking of Dr. Carnita Atwater, we thank her very much for her bravery and courage. She uh, makes me think about Paul Revere. Paul Revere said, the British are coming. Dr. Atwater said, hey, listen, 3.0 is coming. And we must be careful because people have been displaced, like you said, Cedric. Yeah, and then you ought to also remember, you know, when you when you do something like that, uh, you know, you set yourself out there as a big target. So, I mean, they go up under your fingernails. They yes. go, uh, you know, they, they yeah. go up under your armpits. They're going to look for something yes. to, to fight back with because you have to fight with uh, public relations, yes. the media and the press. Right. So uh, she took a lot of hits. Uh, you know, uh, f uh, sometimes death is not physical. So we have to make sure that uh, we stay focused on the real issue. It's not about uh, whether uh, uh, Connie Atwater, um, uh, uh, you know, um, owns a store or whether she's tall or whether she's short or anything else about Connie Atwater. Right. This was about 3.0. This was about the community. And we can't let these distractions that, uh, you know, uh, our, our new president is probably the best at, this misdirection thing. Right. So uh, we don't want to uh, go, go chasing on down the road on some, some far-fetched uh, situation. Whatever happened uh, with, with that, uh, anything outside of 3.0 mm. is handled in a different area, a different arena. And as you know, the, the young folks say, stay in your lane. Yes, hey, <laughs> hey, uh, that's right. Not uh, get distracted. Hey, singleness of purpose is what, it called, is what it's called. Not start talking about uh, the peaches on the tree. Stay focused on 3.0. Because people are losing their property, they're losing their home, losing their communities and neighborhoods, being scattered, gentrification. And let's look at that. Let's define gentrification. And yes, all this stuff is political. We'll be talking about leadership too, Omar. And the mayor was saying something about some of the incidents that happened between some of and they were mostly younger people, fighting and shooting and all of that. And uh, his leadership is being tested. And he said it's hard to solve this problem when the victim and the perpetrator know each other. Hold up right there. We say that leadership is broad and that in that instance, what is required is in the educational system, in the schools, and that parenting classes must be taught in the schools. Not that we must uh, teach about money and how to make money. And we've got some experts at the table today on that. So uh, let's be aware of 3.0 coming your way. 901-452-3094. Give us a call at 901 324-7490. Pick us up online. West Memphis, Arkansas, Sports Channel, AM 730. We've got Stan, the white man, on the table. He will be discussing unity. He will be discussing organizing. And he will say, give the white man his God back. <laughs> We're going to hear that coming soon. <laughs> I go now to Omar Baruti. Take it away. You know, I'd like to thank you for listening in. And I, I want to say this about uh, 3.0. Yes. Uh, Dr. Atwater has analyzed it from one end to the other. Yes. <laughs> and, and as a sister I respect, I've known her for over a decade. Um, it's somebody I trust. And she said, put it in recess and need to stay in recess until it comes back out, remix so that it includes us as beneficiaries of the process. And if it does not include us, all those that vote for it need to be voted out of office on the next go around. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that if it does not include the best interests of those disenfranchised people in this city, then anybody who voted for it, listen good. I'm going to campaign to support your opponent in the next election. <laughs> right. So if your name is on the list, look for me to be on the opposition. Make sure you do that. 
Yes, go ahead, Omar. So, so you know, gentrification, let the people that, that the white folks that, that already moved out of town, they'll stay out of town. <laughs> Bring the money so that we can get rid of some of the poverty that plagues us. And we look at, you know, this thing about the murder rate, most of the time when people die, it's somebody who knows them, they kill them. Mm -hmm. They're not strangers. Mm -hmm. Most of the murders in this, in this country are committed by people that know them. You, you know, you don't walk into a stranger. Sometimes you do, but most times you don't. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people that know you, so that's nothing, nothing new. But again, if, when black folk are doing this, it's, it's because we have not learned to love and respect one another. We have taught self-hatred, and we're still drawing in the land of self-hatred in this country mm -hmm. called America. Mm -hmm. We got to take away the media's, uh, you know, madness mm -hmm. that teach us to continue to hate one another, and teach us, and, and instead should teach us to love one another, respect yes. one another, so that when we see each other, we see ourselves, we see our brother. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't do that, and because of the media control the minds of the people. We go not mm -hmm. And you know what else, Omar? That's why we are called the Love Power Show. But and sometimes I look at love is tough. Mm -hmm. Because it's based on a critical thinking, critical analysis, and the truth, and also reality. And real quick, one more thing, Omar, is that when attending the city council meetings, we see that the developers tend to get Everything, everything they want. The city council seems to vote yes on everything that they ask for. So my question is, is city council, the current, along with the mayor, together, a problem for the community, city council? That's my question. And from looking at it from this angle, that seems to be the case. Yes. Anyone want to come in on that before we go to stand the white man? I'm ready if you are. This, this country was set up by rich white people for the benefit of rich white people. And nothing's changed. Donald Trump is a symptom of the problem. And he is a, a sign for rich white people to know that they are still in charge. The city is the same way. The money people in this city control the city, not the poor people, not the disenfranchised, not the ones at the bottom. Even among white people, that's why they came up with Jim Crow. Jim Crow, Jim Crow was set up so that poor white people would appreciate the condition they were in as long as they went at the bottom where the, where the where black people were. Mm -hmm. Jim Crow. It wasn't set up because the, the rich white people weren't going to those places no way. They were going to have to ride a bus no way. But the poor white people, they were being disenfranchised along with us. They made them feel good that they, at least they weren't niggas. Omar, do you have stand the white man ready? Uh, Cue it up, ready to go. Yeah. All right. The number to call 901-3094 or 901-324-7490. All right, hit it! to a local level 
And we see some of the same attitudes and the same uh, thinking from our present mayor, okay, who is portraying himself as a Democrat, but we know he's heavily loaded as uh, uh, in the Republican Party okay. pocket. So some of these cruel ideas that we're seeing on the national level are also duplicated right here on the local level under the eyes of people who just can't believe it. You know, in other words, even on a national level, there are things going on that, you, that we seem to just don't believe that it's happening. Okay, well, the same thing is happening on the local level. You know, so that's our political climate, uh, nationally and locally. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Yeah. For community for the last 100 years, I just noticed that you guys have been having some problems figuring out what to do about me. You see, I'm a cracker. Yeah, the white man, the guy that has been running the whole world for the last 2,000 years. Well, the reason that I stopped by to speak with you today is to help. I've been watching you guys fight over gaining real black power and thought I would give you a few pointers. Since we white guys have been running things since we invaded Africa, I figured I would have a blueprint to help you achieve your objectives. Might as well use a plan that works, right? Besides, it beats the backward, no progress, mistake repeating methods your people have been trying for the last 400 years. So I knew all of you needed some help. Especially, after Barack Obama got into office, He's a great guy, but a black man in a white man's house ain't really saying much considering all the hell you people have been through. Don't get me wrong. In many ways, I know you were happy to get at least one black into office. This is good when you want to run politics, but ruling the world is what we white folks specialize in. Have you ever heard of the Illuminati? Well, that is the kind of coordination you are going to need to begin taking over the world. Okay, let's get started. Today, I am going to give you three things that we did to take over the world. You can use these two and begin to gain real black power. Number one, the first step to taking over the world is unity. I know you have heard of this before, but black people seem to really struggle with this one. You just don't seem to get it. You would rather fight against each other instead of your enemies. This is bad business and you will never get true freedom doing things this way. Instead, do what we did to gain power. We divided and conquered entire countries based on their differences, while holding true to our similarities. I am white. There is no changing that. My god one tendency is to preserve my own. Nothing is racist about that. It is just common sense. You people are the stupid ones, going around trying to love everybody, but yourselves. We kicked your asses here in America for over 400 years, and you still go around talking about Jesus loves everyone. While you've been doing all the praying and jumping around, we have been buying up the world and making laws you have to abide by. No offense, but everyone else has unity but you. I mean, look at the business in your neighborhoods. The people that control it don't even look like you. In fact, everyone who comes to this country sets up a business in the black community. The Koreans, the Indians, the Chinese, the list goes on and on. Aren't you tired of letting these other people supply all of your food, nails, and weaves? The one thing they have that you don't is unity. Number two, once you get unity, you are going to need to get organized. When we took over the world, we had a plan in place, a goal. Since we whites make up a small percentage of the global population, we knew the only way for us to exist was to enslave non-white people. This was our global plan for white supremacy. But we didn't stop there. We organized a military force behind our goal and executed it to perfection. Killing men, women, and children across the globe with brute force. Whatever we needed, we just took it. And if blacks or Native Americans didn't like it, oh well. Remember, there are no rules in war. Our objective is to ensure survival. But you black people seem to think your economic hardships, social injustices, and high arrest rates just happen by chance alone. 
Never mind. We've worked nearly four centuries, day and night, to keep you people exactly where we want you. On the plantation. Yeah, it's true. Let me tell you a little secret. Most white people are not going to tell you this. It's a whole family secret we have kept pretty quiet about. And for a good reason. You see, all that free labor my white ancestors got from your black ancestors, translated into a lot of money. In fact, the black slave trade was the greatest wealth-building tool in human history. With free labor we were able to finance the Industrial Revolution. Well, all of that money pretty much stayed in the vast majority of white families. And with all due respect, whites intend to keep it that way. You see Dr. Martin Luther King was pretty good at integrating lunch counters and toilets, however, he didn't do so well at integrating bank accounts, so you blacks were shifted out of the money that was due to you in exchange for a good job and education. But it was us whites who owned most of the jobs. Which brings me to my point. It's just another plantation. I say all of that to say, being organized is more than alignment, it is knowing the traps we have laid out for you and then moving around them. Everybody knows but you blacks. That education will only keep you enslaved. It will only produce what it has already produced. A bunch of dressed up plantation workers perfectly content, working and serving under another man's vision. You don't really think we are going to teach you to build a nation for yourselves, do you? If you were really educated you would be able to solve your own problems. Problems like gang violence poor economics and under-representation. Instead, you will continue to pass the notion of getting a good job down to your children. This will brainwash them to be just like you. And the cycle will repeat for generations. While we whites continue to run things at the top, your grandchildren will be celebrating the first black Catholic Pope. I know this has been long, so let's move to number three. The third way to gain black power is the most important of all. It is this way because it deals more with your psychology than your conscious mind. When we took over the world we decided to use the most dangerous weapon of all to subjugate the darker peoples of the planet. We used a combination of white supremacy and religion to mindfuck these people into complete submission. If a robber breaks into your house, rapes your family, kills your mother and father, then tells you that in order to go to heaven, you have to worship as God. If someone did that to me, then said that to be born again, I had to worship as God, I'd kill the bastard right on the spot. But you black people seem to have no problem worshipping the God of your enemies. Even worse is the fact that for all the praying that you have done, it seems like the God of the white man is just as racist as we are. Anytime you start believing in the God of your enemy, it pretty much means you're a complete idiot and a pussy who is too far gone to confront his adversary. This is a deep sickness because to believe the man who murdered your family is your friend, is to believe that watermelons have gills. This kind of thinking lacks critical reasoning, a skill needed to defend territory in the minds of the youth. You even believe that Haiti, the only black nation that ever kicked the white man's ass, is cursed because many of them practice voodoo. You even go further and believe that it was God that hit Haiti with a 7.5 earthquake. You religious-minded blacks thought this about New Orleans too. Let me tell you the truth. We gave you this God, because we knew by worshipping a white God you would subconsciously be worshipping us. That was a part of our plan, and it worked like a charm on the early slave plantations. We whites decided to perfect it, and have taken our gods all over the world to dark people. You see, we know that if we can get you to put down your god, and pick up ours, you will lose your real power. This is really effective for controlling your people. Practically, by doing this, you will never fight against us because subconsciously you would be fighting god. I know that is a serious mindfuck, but that is why you cheer for a white Jesus to kill all the darkies down in Haiti and New Orleans, while kissing Pat Robertson says. Meanwhile our heart machines can shake up more prime real estate for the oil companies. If you continue to follow the god of your enemies, you will never rule the world, because you will always have your allegiance with the white man, instead of your god, who's pissed off because you traded him in for a blonde-haired, blue-eyed hippie, whose name we took from the Greek god Zeus. So, let's recap. 
The top three things you need to do to rule the world and to have black powers. Number one, get some unity. Stop killing each other over nickel bags of weed and coke. You are basically helping to kill off your own army. Stop it and unite. Number two, get organized. There is nothing worse than a bunch of rich rappers talking about gangsta and keeping it real. When all of them still work for rich white and Jewish men that pin them for their talent. With Jay-Z, P. Diddy and Oprah, you black people should have your own distribution company by now. White backers to pound your albums. This is because you are not organized. This goes for all you sports athletes too. You black sports guys are stupid. You're a grown man and you still have an owner. Stop being a slave and wake up. When you die all you will have to pass on to your children as a championship ring. When I die, I will have at least two islands and a few manufacturing companies to extend my legacy. For you sports guys, no one will remember you and the money you blow on trying to floss will be right back into our hands. You need to organize and put your money and minds together for one common goal. Black power. Last but not least, you have to stop following the white man's God. He has really done nothing for you since you started to believe in him. Basically all my God has done for you is allow white guys like me to continue stealing from you. Sure, we'll give you a few rich blacks to make it up the ladder. But this is to keep up open you. So that you will teach cowardness and fear to your children and get nothing in return. You will keep praying while we will keep slaying and taking more land and control of the earth. It will be this way as long as you fall for the lie that some white dude is going to come down from the skies and pull you out of this shit. Stop it. Instead, go back to believing in your God. The God you had when you were rich in Africa and had diamonds, gold, and wealth. It certainly beats the crap the white man's God has given you. Even if you believed in rocks, you would probably have more luck than what you have gotten with this guy. One last thing. Black people need to stop saying that they're blessed. This is not only dumb, but it lets us white people know that we are still very much in control. If I steal you from your home and throw you into a cardboard box, have you work for 400 years on the plantation, just because I give you a pillow, doesn't mean that you were blessed. It just means that I gave you a fucking pillow. If a guy cuts off your hand, and then turns around and gives you a bandage. It don't mean anyone blessed you. He just needs his slave to be able to work the next day. So you are not blessed just because the white man gives you a doggy treat. It simply means you are fucked. So given all the crap you blacks have dealt with here in America, and abroad a new car or money for the white bill are just tools we white folks who are trying to run a plantation do to keep up the morale. So, if going from Africa, a land of milk and honey, diamonds and resources, a place where you had a name and thousands of acres of land, to a place where you were struggling to eat in a one-bedroom apartment every day means you are blessed, then the elephants have fins and iPhones for it perfume. So put the white man's god down, and try to do something for yourself. I hope what I have given you today is food for thought. We will continue this series so that you black people are very clear on how to take over the world and have black power. Next time I will talk about how to make a black woman hate herself so much that she will put a blonde wig on her nappy head. Until next time, remember, I'm Stan the White Man. For more on how the white man rules, insider secrets, stay tuned. All right. We will discuss that and tie leadership into it. But first, we will hear from Omar. He raised some points on critical uh, analysis, critical assessment. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he brought that word critical in there, and he mentioned the youth, young people. Also, I'm interested in this, what is blessed? What is meant by, uh, hey, man, how you doing? Hey, sister, how you doing? I'm blessed. Uh, I'm too blessed to be stressed, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, let's discuss that. I hear, heard uh, someone talking about uh, this is not a racist country. Hey, give us a call right here, 901-452-3094 or 901-324-7490 because I heard uh, Michael Moore 
and you will hear Tim Wise and others discussing things like uh, white privilege. I heard Michael Moore talking about the natives of this country uh, being almost annihilated. I heard him talking about uh, working the Africans free and sometimes to death. And I'm trying to figure out what are they, these people talking about. Uh, give us a call and help me out with my, my thinking, my assessment. Uh, I think I know something about this stuff. I've been around here. Uh, if I had never written one, read one book, I've witnessed some things in this country, Talu. Mm -hmm. Yes. Experience. So you're going to tell me that, no, you didn't see that. That's not what you saw. You know, things such as that. Omar first, and then let's go around the table. You, you know, we always talk about uh, our people being asleep. And they truly are asleep. And it, it is so difficult to wake them up because the media keeps them in a state that's almost like a coma. And when you try to wake them up, they fight you. It's almost like... Yeah, yeah, when you try to wake them up, they fight you. It's almost like they uh, enjoy the comatose state because when they wake up, then they realize this, they have to do something about their condition. Uh, I was in that, that state of mind, uh, and I didn't get, I didn't get the, even the first pinprick about waking up until the war in Vietnam came. And I went before my draft board because as a Sunday school teacher, I believed what I was teaching, and I believed what I was taught to teach. And then when the draft board told me, uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in killing because the book says thou should not kill. The Bible says it. It said, the book says you should love your enemy. Me and the draft board went back and forth over an hour quoting scriptures. And they kept telling me, son, put that damn religion back in the box. We gave you that religion. You're going to fight for your country. I said, no, sir. The book said, and I was quoting scriptures at the Bible. He said, son, after an hour and a half or so, he said, go to your preacher. And if he will write you a letter saying that is truly what y'all believe, that's truly what you all teach, then we'll make you draft exempt. And I was really sad when I went to my preacher at the time, Reverend, Reverend Mullen at Early Grove Baptist Church on Broad Avenue in Leicester Street, when I went there. And we had a discussion like I had with the draft board. <laughs> and he was going back and forth with me about what I'm teaching versus what they believe, what the church believes. Mm -hmm. And then he said, since you believe that, since you believe it, because he kept telling me, you know, maybe you'll get into the military and they give you a, a, a desk job that's typing out death certificates. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and kill anybody. <laughs> but he, and after we went back and forth, I'm quoting the scripture to the, to the pastor. <laughs> And then he said, if you believe that, then you write the letter and I'll sign it. But I was so disheartened. I mean, this, I was just so dis disillusioned when he told me that. Then I began to believe, I began to think, why, why mm -hmm. do I have to have this conversation with the man that's teaching me what to teach to the mm -hmm. children? Mm -hmm. And if we don't believe it, why are we teaching it? Mm -hmm. And then that journey of waking up began. And once you wake up, and I'm talking to the radio audience, once you wake up, mm -hmm. you will not be able to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. We have got to come together. Unity is something Stan the right man talked about, mm -hmm. it, you know, in this century, but it was talked about by, by the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, even before the Stan the right man. It was talked about in the slave plantation, even before Marcus Garvey. It was talked about by Dr. King. It was talked about by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. It's still being talked about right now by, by the honorable Miss Louis Farrakhan. We have got to come together in unity. And it can't be that religion separates us. It can't be that boundary that separates us. Uh, I had somebody call into the office one day. I was telling her I can help her get a house. She'd been to the workshop. Mm -hmm. and, if, and I was telling her all the things we could do to help her. And she asked me this question. Are you a Christian? Because if you're not a Christian, uh, I don't believe you can help me. Yeah. And I said, I've got over 100 people approved already, and I've only been here a year. I said, so what is a Christian? And then she had a moment of silence, and I said, i tell you what. Uh, and I started telling her, the ones I see, they can't claim Christianity, they have a cross around their neck. I said, some of them have their dress cut so low, you can see they're almost the nipples on their breast. 
mm-hmm. when they come sitting in my desk. Mm-hmm. Some of them are in their forties and fifties. They got exploded blue jeans. If it was exposed a little bit more, you can see the hair around their vagina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they claim to be Christians. Yeah. <laughs> I said, so I can't tell a Christian from a non-Christian. Mm-hmm. And I said, if I got to be a Christian to get you a house, then you, you might not get one <laughs> if I got to help you. Right. Because, you know, that labor right there would exclude me because, you know, Christianity is somebody who follows Christ. And I follow Christ, but I don't label myself a Christian. Mm -hmm. But somewhere, that label is dividing us. Mm -hmm. I was at Java one day, Mm -hmm. and there were two people arguing because they were trying to come together to get get a movement going. Mm -hmm. And one I found out the other one was a Jehovah Witness. Mm -hmm. And one was from the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the whole argument turned to nothing but religion for the next hour. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk out there with my head shaking. Mm -hmm. I said, we ain't going to never get out of this condition Mm -hmm. until we come together and religion is dividing us. Mm -hmm. Right, let's hear from Tommy Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy to be back. <laughs> Two weeks is a very, very long it time like off long, radio. It seems like a long I time. I got to crank my mind back up <laughs> for radio, yes. kind of like brain dead. <laughs> but, you know, uh, in, in, in response to uh, Stan the White Man, yes. I just want you all to know that uh, uh, Tiger Woods won. The Masters. All right. Okay. Yeah, he won. Yes, he, he won the Masters after 10 years of lagging and failure, mm-hmm. which I think is a pretty good accomplishment. Yes. Okay. And not Because now he's an old man. Yes. In relationship to the times when he was winning back to back, back to back, right? Yes. And so, but staying the white man, mm-hmm. okay, uh, I would like to call it staying the white man and really Lynch dossier. And neither one is really worth two cents in that I personally would never, ever accept a Caucasian, European, or white man's plan for my survival, for my uh, progression, development, and growth. Never. And the reason why is that they can't do it. Sure, Stan the White Man and the really, really Lynch dossier both have valid points and say some very good things and can be and could be the truth. But coming from that angle, I reject it. Okay. Okay. Now, am I rejecting the truth? Yeah. Why? Because the truth at one time enslaved my ancestors. And the truth were, was their truth, mm-hmm. not my truth, mm-hmm. that enslaved my ancestors. And now for me to take, in this day and time, their plan mm-hmm. for my growth and development mm-hmm. is totally ignorant. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's, it's, it's outside the zone of reality in that your oppressor bringing solutions to his oppression. <clears throat> and for me to accept that is insane. Okay. Okay. So what if he can, if, if Stan the white man can uh, rationalize or speak on setbacks and problems and all these types of things that my people and I are going through? So what? Okay. My solution has to come from my people. Mm-hmm. My people are going to have to get involved and come up with strategies and plans for me mm-hmm. and my children and grandchildren to get out of the condition that we're in. Mm-hmm. I would not accept it. Mm-hmm. All right, let's hear from Cedric. Cedric, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear a response. We have about... 15, we only have an hour for right now. Right. That's going to change. So I really am interested in hearing from you and back to Omar. And um, I would like for you, with the time we have left, the two of you, to respond to Stand the White Man and Talut's assessment of Stand the White Man. And there's a third question. Why would someone uh, put this um, out on the airwaves, or on a document, video, or whatever. And let, let us just say that it is a cartoon, but it is a, it is a cartoon that represents 
what a or some group of humans, human beings, may have to say. Take it away, Cedric. Well, uh, I, I personally, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. I like it. Uh, it's a lot of information in there. Uh, and again, uh, a, a lot of things you have to look at is, uh, is not always one-sided. Uh, with his truth, they, they uh, lean to uh, a portion of the people. And um, I would say all the times, sometimes, what he said was true. And I'm saying that because uh, he was uh, making some blatant, hardcore statements as in it's a fact across the board. Uh, the issues that he raised and the, uh, the topics he raised and uh, the, the uh, formats in which they played out and things such as that, uh, I agreed with uh, a lot of those things. And uh, you could see mostly everything that he says in everyday life. I don't personally, um, uh, you know, the, the religious issue, I, you know, uh, I don't stay away from mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm not the guy that, that uh, stays away from the elephant in the room. Okay. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, uh, similar to the LGBT and all that other stuff. I, I, I don't, I don't shy away from those things. Uh, I mean, uh, just, I have my opinion. Okay. And as uh, some people say, just like, uh, uh, tail feathers, as they say. Uh, or, or rear ends. Everybody has one. So, mm -hmm. and I, I value my opinion. Okay. So uh, on on that um, on that note, I really feel as though the um, uh, the the well, I, you know, I would rather let that uh, 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 Minister Omar go ahead and uh, give us a real assessment. Uh, you know, I, I would uh, you know I would definitely like to come away in on it. Well, on the topics like, uh, like what just happened here, I like to hear from Brother Omar. <laughs> okay, well, a couple of things real quick. I think this is something that perhaps does call into question what it makes a person, how it makes a person feel. But sometimes we have to override our feelings and go with our, our mental or intellectual capacity because in that, that uh, piece, he mentioned a critical, that a group of people who lack a critical assessment. So I want to, I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, we'll perhaps continue this next week. I'll say this is something that we've talked about, and we're going to have to continue it next week, part two. Stay tuned. 901-452-3094 or 901-324-7490, and maybe we'll get a call in uh, for uh, to hear from someone in the audience. Omar, take it away. You, you know what? You have to listen to the YouTube video multiple times to reach the depths of what this man is saying. White people support white people all over the earth, no matter where you go. When they had the Berlin Conference and they split up Africa, black people were not at the table. Mm -hmm. White people came together and decided which African country were you going to take advantage of? Which one were you going to rule? Which one were you going to rape and rob? They split the whole continent of Africa up. Not black, not Chinese, but white people. Right now, World War One and Two fought mostly by white people, against white people. This is who they are. I don't care where they go on the earth, they bring death, blood, and destruction. And like Stan the white man said, they killed the men, the women, the children, and the baby. They do not care. When they killed the Indians, they slaughtered everybody. Nobody was spared. This is who Stan the white man is talking about, his own people. And they didn't have Irish versus whatever. They were white folks first, and then they had all these other things later. When they talk about unity, they are united today. Even today, they're united. In only white countries, except for two countries on Earth, they have their nuclear, nuclear weapons. They want the Koreans to give up their, but they ain't giving up their own nuclear weapons because they want to be the supreme power on the Earth. When you talk about the, the second thing he talked about, which was getting organized. Mm -hmm. That's why they have NATO and all these other uh, these kind of, the European Union. They say European, you know, black folk in, Europe, in the European Union? These are white countries in the European Union. They are organized. We don't have, when they try to do an African Union, then they kill the leaders that were trying to bring it together because they don't want Africa nowhere to get organized. We should be trying to make Africa great again like we used to be before they came. So we got to have that kind of organization, not just in America. I mean, my sister got a, a, a 
thought, what do you call it, thought exchange in our home. Yes. Uh, uh, what's the name, Dr. Uh, Pam Brown. Dr. Pam Brown. We didn't have thought exchanges throughout black America. Mm -hmm. Put the thinking on the table. We didn't have black think tanks. So we can find, think about how we can solve our own problem because they're not going to solve it for us. We got to do that. But listen real close to staying the white man. This morning when I heard it again, mm -hmm. I heard him talk about, you know, the, the people in Haiti mm -hmm. who kicked the white man's butt. Mm -hmm. Then he mentioned just a few sentences later about something called H A A R P, harp. Mm -hmm. You need to go look it up and don't trust me for anything. Anything I say, you go dissect it and examine it for yourself. H A A R P, harp. That's a that's a, a government controlled system in Alaska. <coughs> it's made out of radio antennas, and this this device. These device, it's eight, several acres of radio antenna. They send radio waves into the ionosphere and bounce it off the ionosphere. And when it hits the earth, it causes earthquakes. When the when the, when the earthquake occurred in Haiti, the American military was sent to Haiti three days before the earthquake. The Japanese picked it up on their side side of the graph machines, and they knew it was coming. And then the earthquake came. So they were they were creating the earthquake in Haiti before anybody knew it. They already had put the plan in place, and made it happen. It was not an accident. Even in Katrina, Mr. Farrakhan brought evidence that when that, when that dam broke in Katrina, they blew it up. It had a hole in the side of the dam, and there was military-grade uh, residue on the side walls of that dam. It just, and they could have blown up the other side, but it was in the white folks' neighborhood. These are some, some you know, demons that we're dealing with. You can't just walk any kind of way with these people. you got to understand what you're dealing with. That lady just recently talked about 9-11. Bring to this studio one engineer, one. You can get a bigger arm, but just bring one that can give me definitive evidence that an airplane can knock down a building like, like what they did in, in New York. Bring one. Two buildings got hit, but three buildings fell. One of them, a 47-story building, fell the same day, around the same time, and it fell the same way, and it got hit by nothing. How do you make? How do you understand that? But you got the people believing that two airplanes brought down two buildings, and all those people died because some Muslim terrorists blew, uh, drove some airplanes into buildings. This country is lying to you, and you need to know they're lying to you. And if you continue to believe this wicked government, then you deserve what you get. You got to wake up. You can't stay asleep, hell. Why is black? You got to wake up. This is a demonic country, and you are supporting demons when you support the government like you're doing it right now. Okay. Uh, Talu, do you reject? We've got Four minutes. We've got a minute each. <laughs> There's four of us. Do you reject the uh, the 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 substance, or do you reject the the ethnic background of this particular man? And we it's a cartoon, and we're pretending that it's a real person. One minute. Well, well, I reject the premise. Okay, of what. This is about. See, the, the thing about white supremacy is this. Prove your white supremacy on every level. Okay. If if a if the oppressor can point out to our people line by line where he's successful and we are a failure, that's white supremacy. Okay, and that's what the really Lynch dossier and this. This one, uh, the Stand the White Man dossier, basically are doing. It's just pointing out that I have something to say that you've never thought about. And I can put it in context and in a way that would rattle your soul. And it would prove that I'm superior, subconsciously, that I'm superior. Okay, so I just reject the premise of the okay. whole thing. Cedric. Yes, sir. Well, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with... Uh, with uh, was our uh, uh, Minister Omar over there? Okay. And um, I, I mean, you know, it, like I said, it was so complex that I really want to hear that one a couple more times. Okay. Uh, because each one, I mean, he really went in. Okay. I honestly don't think that's a white man. I really, uh, I, I, I feel the essence of uh, John Henry Clark, uh, somebody behind the, uh, you know, because it was just so much power. <laughs> I mean, and it was so much information. Uh, about uh, about our people, our ancestry, but I mean, it could be a white man that actually wrote that. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, 
I don't know. Let me hear that one a few more times. <laughs> I, well, that's what uh, Omar suggested. And I've heard, I've, and there's, there's several, but I've listened to that one on more than one occasion. And I think I'll do that. Um, but I absolutely love this discussion. And I love the fact that Talut brought out what he brought out. And then, Cedric, you said something, and uh, you wanted to move the needle, and this ne moving the needle would cause you to uh, give it some more thought in terms of being in depth. And uh, what time is it now? Uh, we are now at uh, 3 o'clock, 2.59. Uh, we've got one more minute. Go ahead, Omar. Closing you know, out. It, 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 stay in the white man. If we had said stay in the black man, you would automatically reject it. If we say Jesus is the white man, you accept him. But then we say Jesus is the black man, you reject him. And then you say, well, it don't matter what color he is. But let me hang an Indian Jesus on the wall, and you're a questioner. Let me hang a Chinese one on the wall, and you're a questioner. You're a questioner anything with white supremacy. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> hey, join us next week, everybody. We will continue this discussion as we listen to Stand the White Man more. And the critical assessment, I've got some words that are critical. You, what is blessed, unity, organized, the white man's God, be leashed.